And welcome to another episode of the Collab Talk podcast, where we discuss the convergence of technology, business productivity, and collaboration culture. My guest today is Artu Ajar, a Chief Operating Officer at Mercury, a global logistics company for the biotech and life sciences industries. Welcome, Artu. Thanks, Chris. Thanks for having me. It's great to have you. And this is an exciting topic. We're talking today about transforming business through technology from adoption to sustained impact. So we're really going to explore how businesses can effectively adopt new technologies to drive significant change and growth. Because this is something that, you know, many of us have, our two and I both have this experience of working with customers and adopting new debt technology. And a lot of those projects fail for a lot of different reasons. Um, so we're going to talk about some strategies for assessing your technological readiness, fostering innovation, and just overall success of deployment and, and adoption of new tech uh, initiatives. And so with that, Artu, I'd love for you to introduce mm -hmm. yourself more fully in your background and talk about your company. Yeah, of course. So my name is Artu Ajar. I'm the Chief Operating Officer at Mercury based in Boston. Uh, I was born and raised in Turkey. I came to Boston in 2006 for grad school, and then I stayed, I found a job, uh, and I've been living in Boston since then. Um, I worked in tech companies. I started my career. I'm a mechanical engineer, but I moved to software development. Uh, my first job in the U.S. was in software development. I worked at MathWorks. Then I moved into Amazon Robotics, a combination of my software development, mechanical engineering background, and I moved towards the more uh, the business side of uh, the enterprise organization. So I moved into product management. Um, and I was in robotics, automation, warehousing, logistics since then in different parts. Uh, I worked at Symbatic, uh, right hand robotics most recently before Mercury. And then I joined Mercury uh, in 2022 February. So it has been uh, more than two years. It has been a great journey. As you said, there are many challenges as you transform the technology, digital transformation. Um, so. And I've been working on that transformation since then. Uh, I joined as the VP of product uh, and I uh, worked on, I initi the, the initiative actually started before I joined. So uh, our CEO, Josh Meadow, um, uh, started this initiative and then I took over. But before that, let me tell you a little bit about what we do at Mercury and why we needed digital transformation. I think it will paint a better picture. So Mercury is a 40 something year old, 1980, 40 year old company founded in 1984 in Boston. Um, the initial founders, they uh, retired and they sold the company in 2020. Mercury is a shipping company. It started shipping for law firms uh, because at the time digital signature wasn't out there. And, we did, uh, and up until 2000s, they really focused on professional services uh, for law firms. With the Digital Signature Act in 2000s, they started moving into healthcare life sciences. We are in Boston, right across the river, there's Cambridge. Cambridge is one of the biggest healthcare life sciences hubs, most innovative uh, mile on earth, to be honest. Uh, so many companies out there, they identified that opportunity in 2010 and since then, they've been serving both professional services and healthcare life science. Since the restructuring started in 2020 with Josh Meadow uh, buying the company from the initial founders, uh, the company is in an evolution phase. So at that time, Josh decided to focus on only healthcare life sciences, continue serving to our existing clients. We have clients with us more than 10 years. So we still serve them, but our dedicated focus is on healthcare life science. What we do for them, we divided that market into three segments. These are medical devices like MRI machines or machines that test uh, blood. The second segment is diagnostic kits. These are kits 
that may test uh, if you have cancer or during COVID time, we did lots of COVID tests. The third group is life science research. These are um, early stage biotech companies, but then they move into clinical trial and then they, when they prove their solution, they move into pharmaceuticals. So we work on with those clients. We can ship anything to anywhere globally uh, on earth. We have agents, we have carriers all around the world. In addition to that, the, one of the benefits uh, differentiators that we have is dedicated teams that we assign to our clients. So almost like our clients are insourcing us when they don't have their own logistics function, mm -hmm. whether they're too small to have a logistics function or they don't want to own it. It's not core to their business. Right. They come to us, we provide a solution to them and we take over from them. We assign dedicated teams. It's not like they call a 1-800 number and somebody picks up the phone that they have right. no idea who they are talking to. Right. These are the people that they know by name and each other knows very well uh, who they are talking to, what problems they are facing. So that really differentiates aside from the cost benefits because we have a high volume, we get discounts and we reflect this discount to our clients. We provide this with a technology solution. So now we are getting into that digital transformation. We have a technology we built in 1990s, but it's really not the state of our technology. And with this restructuring uh, started in 2020, um, we started a new initiative, digital transformation. Now, recently we provided our clients a state of our technology to help them uh, initiate their shipment, print their labels, or request the shipment from our squads, our support team, track the shipment, get updates about the shipment if there is anything wrong, and then when it arrives, they can pay for their shipment. So full suite of solutions uh, for every type of shipment. So it's a one-stop shop for them uh, that makes their life really easy. It makes their life easy, but building that solution is not that easy. So. Right. Uh, now I think we can talk about that digital transformation, but in a nutshell, yeah. that's what Mercury does. Um, that's, you know, you just, you, something I, I thought about too, is that a lot of people that aren't kind of tracking this, I mean, I've been in the industry long enough to have seen this, but when really SaaS offering started mm -hmm. in the late nineties, you know, right around 2000, mm -hmm. I mean, I worked for a company, went to work for a startup in 2001 called E2 open that was in the logistics on the high tech manufacturing side. Mm -hmm. and, because they since went public and then got privatized, got bought and uh, back private. But, uh, you know, it is just looking at like what you said is like companies that are saying, why am I in the business of building all this infrastructure and maintaining all this technology when they could go to SaaS services or go to MSPs or do partners that have depth in that industry to provide that expertise so they can then focus on their core business while others own the technology and the process. And where it works the best is, as you say, like first name basis with the people that are, you know, uh, the call them like a, you know, a case management, a customer management, customer success, kind of these, these roles. Yeah. But that's your go-to person, your point of contact, just mm -hmm. like you get on the phone and call your IT person, uh, you know, a floor away, a building away or around the world mm -hmm. to support these things. It's just that it's a vendor doing that. And we're seeing uh, it, there was a lot of reluctance for mm -hmm. SaaS solutions early on. I know I was my company was trying to sell those services. Yep. And then I would join Microsoft. where We built Office 365 and launched it and rebranded twice. And it, when that went live and in public, you know, it's still a lot of people that were very tentative about moving all of their IP over into this third party, mm -hmm. it's Microsoft, but over into that system. Right. There's a lot more trust now around that, which is, I think we're, we're getting into this, this stage of business building where you have more and more, you know, like pure mm -hmm. cloud businesses where everything is outsourced to the experts in those areas. And so you could have a two person operation start up six months ago, but have enterprise level scalability right. of their solutions. Oh yeah, absolutely. Actually, there is more trust on cloud services than on-prem these days because of all the backups and the uh, uptime. So yeah. yes, uh, it changed a lot since the 2000s, right. 
But it's even interesting. I mean, uh, where I wanted to kind of start the discussion was talking about, you know, mm -hmm. implementing new technology. And it used to be like you're installing the software, like buying the servers, installing the software, building that, rolling it out. It, that scenario doesn't happen as often as now purchasing a solution. It's more about the integration into the business mm -hmm. and focusing on the outcomes. So like what is a, a typical a company that, is leveraging your help like what is your approach your process your methodology to working with them on yeah. deploying this new technology right so it's a SaaS offering so basically any company who would like to use it as is it's really a turnkey solution so they can just sign up and ship the next day there is really nothing that they need to do on their end but there are different cohorts of clients so small to medium sized clients, they want to use it as is, and they're happy with it. The enterprise level clients, they want more customization. They want more integration. They may not want to use your UI. They may want integration to their ERP system because they want to consolidate everything under one ERP. So then API integration becomes more critical for them than the solution, the front end that you provide. So. That's the main distinction between a medium-sized client and an enterprise client. The integration, of course, takes longer time than the first solution that you provide, and it's probably uh, more costly for them. But once you integrate to their system, everything is in one place. Yeah. So then they don't need to go to multiple systems. That's the biggest benefit. Do you see though, I mean, you said they could just start using it, but I mean, there is some, if, if, if I was managing a system that does this capability in-house on-prem uh, yeah. and we're moving to a SaaS solution, I mean, mm -hmm. you as a vendor coming in as a partner working with them, do you do any kind of assessment about their overall readiness? Do you look mm -hmm. at, because their business systems could be very different with that technology. If they have an in-house system, it's very rare, to be honest, in our market, that they have an in-house system that they use for shipping and they then start using us. It's mostly they use one of those bigger uh, shipping companies. They go with FedEx, UPS, their mm -hmm. systems. And then once that's not enough for them, the service that they provide, then they come to us. At that point, it's really moving from one SaaS solution to another SaaS solution. There is still some onboarding because let's say the address book, it, the easiest one, like you need to bring their address book into your uh, portal. So they have an easier time to start using your portal. But other than that, it's really creating accounts and it's really one click. It's not that difficult. Yeah. The, the one difficulty might be what you said, if they have an in-house solution, uh, then that's a bigger project because they probably integrated it into their systems and harder to switch from one to the other. But in our case, it's pretty rare, at least at Mercury. Yeah. Well, it, you know, what's interesting too, I think just, uh, you know, older projects, I mean, historically mm -hmm. you had like the, the, the traditional model where like the, the leadership decision to move to a technology or to add new functionality and whether you go and build that yourself or you hire somebody to build it or you acquire a solution but there the decision was made at that leadership that executive level mm -hmm. and you have with more and more of the SaaS solutions there's not the barriers to trying something trialing that and doing that so you have uh, you know, uh, service operations, operations, logistics, a you know, lower down organization that's able to go in all, all the executive cares is like, is the, is the flow of product of innovation stopped, paused, or is it, has it continued through this process? Right. I think a good example in our case is our legacy system versus the new system that we develop. The legacy system has been in use since 1990s. Our clients have been using it. All of their information is in it. All our systems have integration to the legacy system. Mm -hmm. So the third-party software that we use, in-house developed systems used, multiple in-house developed systems used, processes integrated to it. So it was actually harder for us 
to switch systems, moving from legacy to the new technology. And at that point, like the awareness in the organization and the desire and the knowledge, you need to build up all those things ahead of time so that it would become a more successful digital transformation project. So the, it was a bigger lift on our end than for our clients. Um, so uh, like that's more tricky to be honest. And it's not always successful, as you said in the beginning, like most of these projects really fall apart. I worked on multiple of those. Uh, I learned from those failures a lot. And in here, we didn't make big mistakes. I can't say we didn't make any mistake, but apparently like it was eventually a successful project and we managed to release it. Uh, there are of course several steps that you need to take. Like you need to make sure the organization is ready. Yeah. The readiness for our organization was actually at that point more important than our clients because once it's ready to release, our clients are ready to use it. Yeah. Um, the challenge I had in my previous experiences, the organization wasn't ready for that transformation. And not everyone knew about it. Some people heard about it, but they didn't really know what exactly it is and how much it may impact their job. So then that um, job security might become a problem. So when they don't trust you, when they don't know what this will bring to them, then they don't support the project. So it really starts with the leadership team explaining to the whole organization why we are doing this, how it will impact your life, and what would happen if we don't do it. Yeah. So I think in here, before I joined, uh, they paid the road really well and explained it to the organization that the organization was ready to digest that change. Well, that's a, I, I, again, I've had similar experiences where, mm -hmm. you know, what, what is the, the biggest blocker or the cause of a failure and I'll even break out failure, not as when you think of failure or something, just, it didn't work at all. Like we made a mistake. Mm -hmm. Like, no, that's not the kind of the failure. The most of the failure is that like initially you think, okay, we've answered all the questions. We know all the requirements we've done the prep work. And then you get further in and realize hmm. we left out categories. We left out, you know, we didn't answer these other questions or we, we did the best we can, but we were mistaken. And it's, it's different than it is. I mean, that, that's what, that's what a, a good change management process, mm -hmm. uh, a, a good consultant that will, will do where it's more of an, iterative process you're learning as you go making adjustments filling in those gaps but some things sometimes those are you know you can do risk management around a project i mean you're knowledgeable going in doing deployments for customers you've seen where there have been issues you might be able to identify those things sometimes it's unforeseen right. um and, right. you know and, and so you just organizations that are good at adjusting identifying a problem and issue uh, mm -hmm. uh, mitigating that very quickly and getting back on track, even if it's a slightly changed, a deviated direction of that project. But right. those are the ones that find success. Right. I think in the beginning of 2000s or until the beginning of 2000s, we worked on projects mostly on a more waterfall process mm -hmm. that I spent my like six months, eight months writing requirements. And then start yeah. development again uh, for those re requirements, using those requirements. And that really is not the best approach these days, more iterative, as you said. We can use many terms like Scrum Agile. Uh, everyone has a different flavor of it. But yes, make some assumptions, start small, release it, test it out, get feedback, quick feedback, and then make iterations, course corrections. Uh, yeah. That is a more viable path than really waterfall. Like these days, I don't know any company that's really doing waterfall, but even agile, there are different flavors. Like we do agile, we use scrum. Um, we have on our flavor of agile. Um, and currently we are moving into Kanban, but in the beginning of the project, setting up those systems well, really helps you to utilize your resources better. Otherwise, you just throw up people on the project and 
they just scramble and you don't get anywhere. Yeah, that's the, I, I think it, it's a perfect segue into kind of my next question, like about um, talking about, are there specific cultural mm -hmm. adjustments that you make mm -hmm. working with different clients? Because one of the things, again, key learning, that one of my takeaways in my career mm -hmm. is that when you are going in either as, as an employee, like I've been you know, in the IT department or part of a shared services team, or as an external expert or consultant that's brought in around those things, mm -hmm. the more closely you can map, okay, here's my methodology. And I always say almost every episode of this show, I say, I don't care what methodology you have, mm -hmm. have a methodology have a process, some rigor around your approach to projects. Um, but whatever that is, it's, I then try to go in with a client, with a team and say, okay, what is your culture for projects for change? Like, do you have a methodology? And I try to then make sure that I map to theirs so that, you know, people are comfortable. When people understand the process, they're more likely to participate in the process. Mm -hmm. Yes. Both internally and externally. Yeah. I agree. Like you have some champions, friendly clients that you collaborate throughout the development to get early feedback. And you need to be really careful about choosing who to work with throughout that process. Not everyone is really willing to provide feedback or patient enough, and they don't really understand why they are in the process. Some are really into it and they want to give feedback. Um, so we were lucky to have those long relationships with our clients that they participated as part of that development process. The key is more on the internal side, especially for a company in our size and at that age. It's not a typical startup. It's not really a startup actually, like founded in 1984, people have been working here for many, many years, 20 years, like it's not, typical these days. People work for a few years and then they leave. And it's hard to explain to those people why we are doing it. And then for them to feel that, yes, we should do it. They embrace it. And then they then learn how to do it. Like explaining agile, using more modern tools. Uh, it takes time. Even that awareness like I remember when we first started the project in 2022, the very first things uh, we did, we had marks, water bottles that calls the project name, yep. t-shirts, like everyone- the old knew. school launch. Yeah. And having that, exactly. yeah, yep. Yeah. Yep. And it's not really throwaway money. Like it means a lot for the organization, for them. They then understand, okay, there's a project called X and here's why they are doing it. And here's how I can contribute to it. And when it's done, here's how my, my life will change. Um, so then you need to be able to hire and have the budget to hire uh, and finances, the skills, because you may not have the right skills in the organization to be able to build that new technology. Yeah. But that's the next critical part. Once you have the team built, so people have been here, they understand, they know why we are doing, they support it. New people, the right people in the right seat. And then making sure the whole system works well, you basically give them autonomy, but have guardrails around it mm -hmm. and build the right system, like Agile, our own uh, flavor of Agile process. We spent months to set it right in the beginning. Uh, and it went really well, to be honest. Like, I think we were lucky enough that the organization embraced it. The new people joined the company. They really own the project uh, and the right people in the right seat. So we, we released it. Like we started the project in 2022, September. The first sprint was run in September, 2022. And the first release to a client was in 2023, uh, April. So it's almost like a nine month project. Uh, it's pretty fast to be honest, uh, ground up building a solution, releasing it to the market still in iterations. Of course, it's not the, it's MVP. So yeah. it was MVP. Well, 
Hey, this is a good good question on that that point. So I mean, I've worked for I'm like newer. To, I've done consulting and things, but mm -hmm. I'm I really consider myself more of a product person. Mm -hmm. I've been in those roles, worked for you know ISVs uh, mm -hmm. in a couple yeah. different spaces. How do you balance? So uh, so you guys have your solution. You've got the services side. You're working with clients. How do you balance that the need for continual innovation in what you're doing? Uh, with the kind of the operational demands of running the business as well as the customer, the specific customer needs. Like, how, so how do you, as a as an organization, kind of divide your time between those three things? So in our case, those were almost like two separate entities. One is on the operational side, running day-to-day -day business using the legacy tools. We did not uh, deprecate those tools. They are still in use and we use some of those in the background. So we are, as we are building it, and then we are using pieces of the legacy tools and then integrated to the new tools. And then we build the new tools. And then as we build the functionality that's in the old code into the new one, you then start retiring pieces of it, not the whole thing. You basically take chunks from the old uh, solution. Uh, the tricky part is when you have a solution and a process, you shouldn't be building just for the sake of building a state of art technology using the same process. You need to evolve your processes as well. Otherwise, you would build the exact same solution, but just using newer tools, which would not really add value to your clients. That's like the trap most companies do. They have a process, they just take it and then rebuild it. Yeah. Uh, we did process improvement. Our operations team was amazingly supportive during that time, really. Uh, they took part, almost like a product manager, gave feedback, educated our new people on the technology side, on the product side, how they do things, what are the inefficiencies. And because we had newer people, they then started questioning our existing processes yeah. because they have no idea how yeah. it can No, be it's done. great to have that fresh perspective, which right. a lot of times consultants, third parties come in, work with the company. You're doing the same thing for your client. And that's, I mean, that's always a great way, you know, again, having been in the product mm -hmm. realm, you've got information coming in, obviously, from your customers that are using your products. You have, you know, through the support uh, logs of like, what are the issues people are saying? Well, there's mm -hmm. patterns that you start identifying. Well, we obviously need to go build features to improve that area or improve our documentation or improve our, our deployment methodology. We missed something here where we need to like all that kind of great feedback from the customers, mm -hmm. but then organizations are not as good at a, a similar approach in their own operations. So there's the, there's that side of it. You need to feed a lot of that information, both from operations and from the customer yeah. into then product, the innovation side. Mm -hmm. Like you need to be doing all three of those things. So if you're, if you have the same process and you've not changed it in 20 years, like mm -hmm. I, I guarantee that you are overdue for an overhaul. Oh, yeah. And so having those new voices or hire a consultant to come in mm -hmm. and give a broader perspective Right. Um, usually comes with massive change. You don't have to do it all at once. You don't have to accept the, all those suggestions. Right. But I guarantee you that there are changes that need to be made. Oh, yeah. That simplification is really the key. Without simplifying, if you just rebuild the same process, uh, that wouldn't add as much value. Uh, that's what we did. We are continually doing it. Uh, it it's not done. Um, mm -hmm. But to your point, having that fresh mindset with the experience um, that we have in-house, uh, the two worked well together. Uh, it's really the culture of the company. Like if yeah. you build the right culture, if you set the right culture, set right mindset, then it works. Uh, in another example, another company I worked at uh, for a short period of time, uh, I, similar project, uh, almost still in healthcare life science, that didn't go anywhere after like a year um, because the company, only a few people had any idea what we were doing. Uh, I remember it was a 
lunch meeting Friday, they used to bring lunch. One person just talks about what they do and they said, why don't you talk about what we do on the product? I said, I'm not sure. And I started, as you guys know, we are working on this project and it was like deer in headlights. Like, and then I was like, do you guys know what really we are working on? And they had no idea. So that really surprised me in a company less than like 50 people that they didn't know what we were doing and we didn't get much support. And that project really didn't go anywhere and eventually killed. Yeah. Um, so that's why when I first started, I was like, sure that everyone is on board with this. Um, yeah. Well, that's what, I mean, that's the benefit. I mean, old school, uh, you know, as a, as I started as a business analyst, then as a project manager, and the methodology that we had, it was very, again, it was the old waterfall method. This is early nineties. Mm -hmm. right. uh, and, but the, it was built into my, uh, uh, you know, my, it, just the tools that I took away, what I saw the successes were when there was a very robust kickoff, a launch event where mm -hmm. you talk about, here's our goals, here's what we're doing. Here's what we think the impacts will be. Here's like all of those factors and as part of that, you're also identifying like, who are the stakeholders? Who are the voices that need to participate in this? Who wants to just be informed? Who needs to be participating in the decisions, you know, kind of going forward, but you define all of that. You then have transparency along the way. Like, here's where we are. Here's where we are to delivering on each of these things, the milestones, kind of all those. And there's all sorts of methodologies for that. But then I'm also a big believer in the post-mortem. Like you get through that. And like yeah. what worked, what didn't work, what yeah. do we need to improve on, on the product, on the process, the people that we have there, like all of those things are up for grabs. Documenting all of that, being transparent about all of that is mm -hmm. that it is so critical for oh, yeah. you learning as a, as a vendor, but for those organizations as well. Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. Like one good example, when we made the first release, we made some assumptions we didn't know and uh, we started with those assumptions. We tested our, the results, the usage reports and watched how people interact with it, get real feedback, real time feedback, meet with the clients. And what we learned is really they were happy with some aspects of our existing legacy solution. Uh, they don't care if it was built in 1990s and the code base is not robust, but they like some aspects and they said, this is what I liked about it. And now what you built in here, it doesn't have it. And I was like, okay, fine. Like we can make it. So then we switched, we made changes and we made it available in the new software as well. Um, but to your point, iteration, making small changes, get quick feedback and then adapt to those changes. Uh, and have a robust code base uh, really to be able to make those changes is critical. Uh, we have a team, overseas team in Turkey. I'm from Turkey, as I said. Uh, they build a very robust solution uh, mm -hmm. using microservices. We can make quick changes. Mm -hmm. Today, we can make releases at any time, uh, like any day. Uh, we don't need to wait a release cycle. In like 2000s, 1990s, we used to release like once a year, twice a year was a success. Right. Now yeah. it's like any time, any day, if you are ready, you can release it. Uh, yeah. So we are at that point. So that makes us really agile uh, as a company. Yeah. How much do you also, uh, is the going in as part of digital transformation? It's not just yeah. about the project that you were brought in to deploy that and work with them. How much do you actually work with your clients on their larger technology strategy? So beyond what you're providing, uh, mm -hmm. is that part of what you help your clients with? So whether they then work with you on a future project or do things themselves or you know, other pieces, how much do you get into that roadmap, roadmap for them? We didn't get into that yet, but we talked about doing this and providing other solutions to our clients as well as we under, understand their systems. And that starts with integrating, in, integrating into their systems, understanding their problems may or may not be related to shipping, we can provide other solutions to our clients. We are not really there yet. As a company, one thing I learned working at a startup, you need to really focus. And if you don't focus, if you spread too thin, then you don't do anything really well. And in here, we want to do shipping, the basics, really well. 
yeah. really nail it, provide value to the clients. Once we know we are great at it, then we'll go after other opportunities, provide other value to our existing clients. Uh, and at that point, yes, we will provide different solutions. That's really on our roadmap. Yeah. So do you see uh, other effects of like your interaction with customers going through this kind of, uh, you know, adoption of new technology can sometimes really uh, um, have an impact on creativity. Sometimes it'll actually stifle, like people will be, you know, uh, they're, they're, they're changing their world. And so it, it, it's difficult for them. And while others embrace that, so is that something that you've seen right. when you've done deployments? I do. So we have another solution, which was built even before the legacy. Uh, mm -hmm. like, was it like, was it like COBOL based? <laughs> I don't even really know. I don't think anyone knows the code base at this point. It was okay. built like, I don't think those people are, they, those people are not here anymore. It's really on-prem, uh, yeah. like running on their service, not even on our service. Uh, so I always bring up COBOL because I worked early in my career. I worked for EDS, if you remember them. And, yeah. and I was a, an, an analyst, a technical writer and an analyst. And they uh, offered to put me through and become an engineer. And it was all COBOL based because it was all, it was all healthcare. It was California uh, mm -hmm. uh, um, Medicare. So, uh, yeah. and I just, I, I was already well past, you know, any interest in COBOL. Of course, mm -hmm. years later, that was before Y2K and, all of the people and some of my friends that went through the training program became COBOL programmers were making three, four hundred dollars an hour, you know, and did very well. And some of them retired early and brought back in. But a lot of those financial systems and healthcare systems are still mm -hmm. built on that old technology. And there's not replacement people to go and work on that technology. And it, they work. Yeah, it works. They don't change it. Right. Yeah. If it works, don't touch. Uh, that's sometimes the mindset, really, if it works, really don't touch. I'm happy with what I have. Um, and with those clients, it's harder to explain why SaaS is safe. Being on the cloud is yeah. safe. Yeah. Uh, if they are used to having their server in their back room uh, and they lock, they think it's safe. Um, but when it's yeah. on the cloud, it's not. That's a harder uh, conversation. Yes, we have that one example. But I think we are gonna convince them. Yeah, it, it's a, I, I, it's, it's still. I'm again working in the Microsoft ecosystem. I was a SharePoint guy, and and mm -hmm. so I started. It was all on prem, and yeah. and for as I said, you know, since I worked for this other SaaS company, went to work for them in 2001. I mean, some of the arguments against the cloud, you know, mm -hmm. I still hear them occasionally. I mean, it's nothing close to what it was even 10 years ago it's really accelerated the move towards the cloud and new startups. Like nobody is deploying on-prem first. It's all cloud first and right. as needed, because there still are case scenarios where mm -hmm. having on-prem, it makes sense. But a lot of the fears to your point, yeah. I think, uh, do I, do I trust a, a global, uh, hoster provider that has, uh, um, if you've ever seen the movie Tron, the first one, you know, that really big door, that massive thick door. Uh, couple, I've been to a couple data centers that have those doors. Like it could probably survive a nuclear blast kind of doors. Um, mm -hmm. But that level of protection and all of the certifications that they have and all of the processes in place to mitigate failures of hardware right. and software and kind of all those things like really your IT team, are you equipped to do all that? Right. Are you right. running that? Do you have SLAs in place for, mm -hmm. you know, 24 seven uptime, like 99, you know, like four nines uh, or five mm -hmm. nines, whatever it is that the standard is. Exactly. Yeah. I mean, we feel it more and more that how robust those systems are today. You don't really need a full uh, infrastructure team. You can't really build it to be honest today but it's ready turnkey for us, for our developers and for our clients, it's even more expensive for them if they want to do it in-house. Uh, right. So, and to be honest, more secure. Uh, it is more secure, but, just but I mean, the other side of it is so, so many new features. I mean, you look at like the AI stuff, like mm -hmm. can you go and, and run an LLM on your own servers and do this? Like, yeah, mm -hmm. 
there's a lot of limitations and there's other secure ways of doing that in the cloud too. Right. But really so many uh, of the products that we have, you have to have mm -hmm. the, the, the internet because the processing and the scalability of those resources, the oh, servers yeah. to be able to do that. If you've got, if you overload on concurrent users on an application, mm -hmm. that used to be a massive problem for us. So right. we had this mass reserve of servers for these dedicated cloud platforms Right. Just in case the 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 workload, the concurrent mm -hmm. users, you know, instead yeah. of like typically there might be a thousand users at any given time on the system, mm -hmm. but during working hours it's like fifty thousand, and in peak times it could be you know two hundred and fifty thousand people all at the same time trying to do this. Thing. And what happens? It yeah. brings down the system. It crashes the servers. It yeah. it gets rid of that. So like again. I, I, I'm not trying to scare people who are doing on-prem, you know, your limitations of your on-prem system, mm -hmm. but they're uh, like the, the reasoning, the fears behind the cloud, like mm -hmm. are just not as realistic as that felt yeah. 10 years ago. And more cost effective to your point. If you just resource based on the peak time, then you overspent. Right. Uh, if you don't, then you may have outages. Your servers may not. You don't have the. You don't have the computing power. Yes. So you scaling up, scaling down. It's and it's pretty practical to be honest. Like to be like easy uh, yeah. for your engineers to adapt. Um, yeah. So on the AI side, it's a different story. Uh, not that I'm against AI, we use AI. We use AI for development purposes as well, mm -hmm. especially with our more junior developers. Um, we use AI on the operation side. We are gonna integrate AI into our portal for various reasons. I think on the AI side, companies should be careful about what they share on the AI platform. Of course, That's especially the consumer-based ones, yes. Exactly. Sure. because. It's going to learn eventually from what you feed to it, and then it will be available to everyone. So if you share your secret sauce as a company, then it's available. Um, not every company, of course, can create their own AI models. You need to go out and use the existing AI models, but there are ways to mitigate that problem that you can have your own instances. Um, so that's a critical part, uh, that most people oversee, uh, it's kind of new, um, and exciting. What would you say, uh, are the key steps? This isn't like a specific customer in mind, but more of like <laughs> your approach to yeah. in general, to, um, all, all these things, a digital transformation, like what, what are, what's kind of your process, the key steps for. Uh, developing a technology strategy uh, and aligning those things with your organizational goals? Mm -hmm. Like there's a methodology called, uh, the acronym is ATCAR, like awareness, yep. Yep. Mm -hmm. desire, knowledge, and then ability and reinforcement. Mm -hmm. You don't need to follow these like literally, but in the beginning, the organization should be aware of what they are doing, why they are doing, how it's going to impact their life. And then have them embrace it and feel it, it's they are part of it. And then train your resources, teach them how to build that system, what part they are going to play and what they need to learn. Then hire the right skills. And if you don't like wrong people off the bus, right people on the bus and right people in the right seat. Once you have that set up, then really reinforce the team, give autonomy to them, but put some guardrails mm -hmm. and then let them run the project. Yeah. That's really the key uh, in any organization, any digital transformation project. If you miss the first step, the awareness part, that's where the problem starts, to be honest. Even if you have the right people, uh, you may have the all-star team, but you may still lose. Yeah, that's why, again, having... I was just having a conversation earlier this week, working with, you know, one of the, my partners uh, and with one of their clients around the communication strategy, how critical mm -hmm. that is. Like you, you have your 
process, the methodology, you've got like the launch, you get the right people that are involved, but you need to sustain that over time. And part of that is, uh, you know, that level of transparency, the communication that you provide so that, uh, you know, they're getting the updates, they know the progress. And when issues arise where they're able to say, oh, oh, hey, this is actually impacting my department now. I need to, we need to discuss this before the next step. Um, if they're not actively participating, sometimes, I mean, that's always the frustration. My background is both product and project manager mm -hmm. is the people that I know need to be involved that just haven't prioritized the project. And then only when, you know, they, they've been given all the communications, they had not been actively participating and then something gets passed and then they realize, oh, that change impacted us this way. It's like, where were you during the design talks? Where were you when we were going through all these, these exercises? My point is that sometimes it can feel like bureaucracy, but the whole point mm -hmm. is that all of the players, all of the stakeholders need to be involved so that you can catch things early mm -hmm. and put this digital transformation through, you know, complete the project. Exactly. Yes, it feels like there is bureaucracy, but it really is not. Without those meetings, without those conversations, ceremonies, uh, especially in the beginning, once we have a more well-established team process and people know what they are doing, you can scale back and you can make it simpler. Like we started with a very true agile scrum process with all the ceremonies. I even added more meetings around it to be able to uh, bring awareness to the leadership team, what we have on the roadmap, uh, we, what we commit for the next month. Uh, so that puts some pressure on the team that they need to deliver this until the next meeting. The next meeting, you get feedback from the leadership team. They know what you built. You actually build trust in the organization by sharing all of this. Even if it seems like waste of time, it really adds value to the project. Later on, like nowadays, we are moving to more Kanban style mm -hmm. and everyone knows what we are doing. They already saw the value. There is enough support. The team is really self-sufficient and it's not like a huge team. They just take work from the backlog and they work. They know what to do. The tools are in place. Uh, so it, at different stages, the needs are different. So you should be able to adapt to that uh, change. At what With your deployments, so going back to kind of it, with uh, Mercury and, and your customers, what's the role of data and analytics in mm -hmm. kind of ah. guiding those projects forward? I mean, how much are you leveraging them? You know, what, what does that process look like? It's a lot. It's a lot. Even as a small company, uh, in the very beginning, before I joined, uh, the company focused on data. Uh, driven by the leadership team. We have good data tools. Data is one thing, information is the other, like data, raw data. Like I can correlate anything to anything using data, right. Right? right? But it may not be the right correlation. So we had that infrastructure, then we started utilizing that data infrastructure to come up with some hypothesis and test those hypotheses and then see how it goes. Uh, see how people use the product, what services they use, how they interact with the product, uh, what works, what doesn't work, what, uh, what features are more used for what purposes, um, where we generate more revenue. Like the data is not just about your software usage, but your entire business. How long it takes for us to respond to a client is extremely important. If you don't pick up the phone within the first 10 seconds, you lose it. No one would wait on the phone. We track that data. How many issues you have in every shipment every week? We track that data. Of course, the number itself does not mean much. You need to dig into the uh, story behind it, mm -hmm. but it's a pointer. On the development side, we track story points, but story point is actually a very abstract concept doesn't really mean much, but it gives you an idea how the team is, how efficient the team is. Yeah. Is it improving? The relative story point number is more important than the absolute number. Yeah. 
And then on the gross profit financial side, we track, we made these changes, we had this many shipments, we released this feature, did it impact anything? Are we making more? Are we shipping more? Are we, are we able to ship more with the same number of resources because we have a better technology, because we are more efficient? Mm -hmm. um, and you can look at your client cohorts. What clients are the most valuable clients for your organization? So then you can feed that data to your sales team that they would then go after those clients, those types of clients. Okay. So we have been doing this very actively. I, I wouldn't say we are like great at it. We don't have a full data team. We have people interested in it. Um, so they bring value. We have um, database people supporting that initiative. But at the company, at the scale, I would say this is one of the best I've ever seen. Um, and it's going to evolve. We are going to tie that data. We are going to learn from that and yeah. iterate. Um, yeah. Well, that really goes back to what I was talking about is like, you've got data that's coming from customers. You've mm -hmm. got, uh, uh, data that's coming from like the product usage itself. That's blind to it's looking across all the customers. You've got the operational data. And then you've got sales and marketing as well. And, mm -hmm. and so you've got all these things and indicators around that. And again, that, that companies need to be thinking about all of those data points and be right. utilizing them. You know, mm -hmm. there's some that are better than others, some that just kind of ignore all that and just kind of go with what they think is best based on their, their own experience. And I think they're just, it's not as finely tuned for developing your strategy as a company. And I think you miss out on a lot of indicators by not looking at that data. Yeah. One thing I realized sometimes if you are too data focused, you can look at the numbers and infer from those numbers. A better approach would be you understand the business, you have some hypothesis, and then you go back and look at the data if your hypotheses are accurate. Right. Well, wow. it's, it's, I always say that, uh, you know, a, a slice of data is useless. It's the trends is the movement over time. Exactly. That's what you're looking at. Yes. Yes. Yeah. I had an executive that I worked with. In fact, she wanted in like the, in the charts and, and whatever you gave her on performance of, because there might be just suddenly there's five the, times the number of tickets around it yet. Mm -hmm it's still a green arrow. Like it's still, it's, it's working, it's, it's going. Like we expected these kinds of smaller issues. We're able to resolve them quickly, you know? And so we had this little green arrow pointing up, a yellow one going, you know, mm -hmm. horizontal and, and red arrows pointing down just to give that view of the trending information. I know like even Excel has that as the ability. There's a right. you don't need trans product, food. but yeah, anyway, yeah. Yeah, yeah. no, absolutely. Yes, trends. I care about trends more than anything else. Yes, I agree. Well, a final question for you here. Um, what advice would you give to organizations that are just starting their journey of this technological transformation? Mm -hmm. Make sure the company is ready to do the technological transformation. It's not an inexpensive initiative. You need to allocate resources. You need to allocate budget, time, the right people, right mindset. Without really thinking through from the start to the end, if you just jump into it, you may spend money, waste your time. It may not go anywhere. And because of that failure you made in the first attempt, you may not be able to start the second attempt because no one will trust. Right. Uh, so like doing it the right the first time, spending more time, you sharpen your blade, spend time, and then chop the tree once is more important. So, yeah. yeah. That's, it, it's so true too, is about that level of trust. You can, I always say that you can have the most successful technology deployment mm -hmm. uh, as far as the architecture, the design, the finished product of it, exactly what you promised, deliver that to a client. Right. But if then nobody uses it, no one adopts it, like you failed mm -hmm. on that side of it, was it a success? No. The executives will look and say, we spent all this money in this beautiful thing that then nobody uses. Therefore, it was a failure. Right. So, yeah, be very careful of your metrics and what those things are. What what does success actually look like? Yeah. That's a good conversation to have. Yeah, absolutely. Um, 
so yeah i mean it's a journey yeah. uh it's not done in one shot it continues we started two years ago it's still going on if you look at our roadmap at least we have more than one year uh work uh in the backlog that we know i'm sure there is more um but step by it it requires some patience yeah. uh really success doesn't happen overnight like um most companies if you look at today it took them maybe 20 30 years to get there yeah. um yeah we admire apple or in another industry we admire starbucks but if you look at when they really started those companies and what mistakes they made how they got there uh it's a matter of time and being patient and perseverance like you don't give up you try uh, you make mistakes learn from your mistakes and then go from there yeah well hey for er every success is paved with the road of failures so it's like oh, yeah. you to learn from that yeah. so we never talk about the failures, but yeah, the except in business school, lots of failure discussions in business yeah. school. But. Yeah, yeah, I learn from my mistakes and failures yeah. more than the successes. Well, that's that's and hopefully uh, organizations, I think, are kind of waking up to the fact that they have to allow people to make mistakes. You don't want to make mistakes in your yeah. job, but you also have to realize that hey, there are some mistakes which are honest. It was part of the learning process, mm -hmm. and you have to allow. Uh, people to fail quickly and get back up there and, and go. And uh, in, in my experience, again, is most of those failures, the, those people will never make that mistake again. Yeah, I always tell my teams uh, in the company, it's okay to make a mistake. Don't make the same mistake twice. Right. Yep. Like, yeah, I agree. Well, R2, really appreciate your time for joining the Collab Talk podcast. And for folks that want to find out more about uh, Mercury, like any – like. Any kind of call to action or pitch for yeah. Mercury? Yeah. If they go to shipmercury.com, uh, they can contact us. Someone from our sales team will immediately uh, reach out to them. Happy to have a conversation with them. Soon we will have a self onboarding. So they won't even need to talk to anyone. They will be able to go and request shipping. We will release it soon. So it's coming. But for now, they can just go to shipmercury.com. Excellent. And of course, we'll have... Uh, your social profiles out there too for folks that want to uh, reach out to R2 and talk with, connect with him uh, through LinkedIn, for example, and we'll have those links there as well. But R2, really appreciate your time. Thanks, Chris. Chris, thank you. You've been listening to the Collab Talk podcast. New episodes are published weekly, and you can find us on Spotify, Apple Podcast, iHeartRadio, and most other podcast platforms. Thanks for listening.